Amen. Good morning. Merry Christmas. A few days late. Uh, congratulations, you made it. I know the, uh, the week between Christmas and New Year's is kind of like a, a wormhole of time where it could be Tuesday all week, or we, we just don't know. But it's Sunday, you're at church, you're worshiping, we're on the right track. Um, Pastor Ridge, he and his wife, they are on the way to Missouri today. They're spending a little bit of time together this week before she goes back to teach in the spring. So be praying for them for uh, safe travels on the way up there today and just some quality time together. You know, today we're talking about the wise men, the magi. And I know it's after Christmas, but we're just going to keep this thing going for a couple more days. My question for you guys is, had y'all ever been late for something? Something important, okay? Not just like late for... Maybe everything's important when you're an adult. I don't know. I'm still figuring it out. But um, maybe you overslept. Maybe you hit traffic on the way. Maybe your car broke down. Maybe your child was sick. You know, um, almost a year ago now, I was going to uh, a friend's wedding. Tanner Wilson, some of y'all remember him. He used to come here to Memorial. He was a college student at UMHB. I think this was last spring. Um, this is supposed to be a funny story, and it's at my expense. So if you feel the need to laugh at me, that's okay. I've come to terms with it. But I was going to his wedding. It was at Insulado, just off the interstate. And I was going, I was traveling to the wedding from where I live, out between Academy and Holland. And so I had my, my maps pulled up. I was taking some back roads. And I hate being late. I'm not, especially a wedding. You can't be late to it. Weddings and funerals, don't be late to those. Okay? That's my advice. But... Um, I gave myself plenty of time, and I was taking some back roads, and I finally I get to the wedding venue, past Johnny's Steakhouse, I turn left, and I go through like the, the gate of the ranch, and then there's a fork, and it says like wedding chapel to the right, and I don't see a sign forward, but I see buildings and I see cars, and so I, I like almost slow to a stop, and I'm trying to think, okay, what, where's this wedding? But I see the chapels off to the right, and I see cars and buildings. So my first thought was, maybe the wedding's over here, like the actual ceremony, and then the, the reception will be over here. And so I, I turn to the right, and my fears are relieved. I pull up. I see a wedding, like outdoor wedding chairs in the distance, and people are gathering, a little chapel. But I don't see anybody from our church yet, and I know there's a few people from our church coming. Still probably 15 minutes ahead of time. And so I just sit in my car and like look on my phone, pretend to be busy for a second. And finally I was like, all right, if everyone else is going to be late, that's on them. I've got to show up to this wedding. And so I walk over there, and there's so many cowboy hats. A lot of cowboy hats, but I don't know Tanner's family that well, so maybe they wear cowboy hats a lot. I grab a seat, still don't see anybody I know. I sit there for about five minutes. It's probably five till wedding, and I happen to overhear. Maybe I'm being nosy, or maybe I'm, I'm just like alert because it's a tense moment. But the people in the row behind me, there's a young woman, and she's on the phone, and she's talking to her friend, and she's trying to give her directions to this ranch. And she's not having very much success. And so a nice young man on the back, I I learned from this experience, they didn't know each other, says, hey, I can help give her directions. So she passes him the phone. I was like, well, that's kind of cool. Like, you know, strangers helping each other out. So he's telling her, he's like, okay, so you're past Johnny's. All right, you're turning left into the ranch gate. He goes, okay, now there's actually two weddings here today. He goes, if you go to the right, that's where we're at. That's the brown wedding. And if you go to the left, go straight. That's the, like the Wilson or some other wedding. And at that exact moment, I realized I'm about to celebrate the wrong wedding. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and so my first thought is, I mean, it's almost game time. And so I was like, I guess I'm just congratulating the young couple and I'll get out of here. But really, I was like, I've got to get over there. And so um, I pop up and I just start walking like really briskly. And as I leave, I see the groomsmen rounding the corner. And I'm like, man, I'm not going to make it to the other wedding on time. But I get in my car, and I scoot across the ranch. Um, I turn right. I see some more of our church members hustling over there. And thankfully, I make it just barely in time. I walk past, and Tanner's up front, his happy self. He's like, oh, hey, Jeff, it's good to see you. And I'm sweating bullets because I barely made it. And I almost like, we got to the reception, and I told people, I was like, I went to the wrong wedding. <laughs> And like, the what? And I was like, I almost celebrated another wedding. I could have left in cowboy hats and a boot, and they would have been my new best friend. I don't know. (laughs) So I wasn't late, but I almost missed it. And so here we are. Christmas has passed. On the calendar, Jesus is born. His birth has occurred. He is here. 
yet we are about to meet some of the earliest worshipers of Jesus, the Magi. Some of the earliest we know about, but we know that they were late. They didn't show up the same night the shepherds did. It says that um, a lot of scholars think anywhere from a few weeks um, up to two years after Jesus' birth is when these wise men arrived. See, here's the thing. They were late. They didn't make it in time for the birth. But guess what? They didn't miss it. Because they responded appropriately when they got there. And so last week, Ridge discussed the power and the implications of the angelic revelation to the shepherds. Okay, the shepherds, he reminded us, were the low, like the low man on the totem pole for Jewish society. They spent all their time with livestock. They probably didn't smell great. They didn't get the same education. And so the power of that revelation to the shepherds was one of God's way of saying, look, this um, king that I'm sending you, King Jesus, he's not just for the wealthy people or um, the educated people in your society. And today we're going to learn um, that Jesus also came for people who weren't Jewish, who weren't God's chosen people to that point. Amen. It shows us that the king of the Jews, he didn't just come for the rich and the poor Jewish society. He came for the entire world, each of us. Even as a baby, Jesus did, in that moment, he had authority over all, Gentile or Jew. We're going to be in Matthew 2 today, so go ahead and flip on over there. I'll give you a second, and then I'm going to ask you guys to pray with me before we read today. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the time to be together in worship, even in the, uh, the chaos and just the busyness of the holiday season. God, I pray that we had um, quality time with family or friends. And Lord, if we didn't, if we were just missing people, if we were lonely, that Jesus, you would meet us here and that um, as a family, we can celebrate um, your birth, Jesus, your arrival, and also what that means for us, God. We love you, Jesus, and I just pray that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear um, from you today, God, from your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. We're going to read Matthew chapter 2, 1 through 12 together, and then we'll kind of go back through and work our way through it. So Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. It says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the, days of Je- in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived unexpectedly in Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all of the chief, all of the chief priests and the scribes of the people And he asked them where the Messiah would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they said, because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, because out of you will come a leader who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men, and he asked them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. After hearing the king, they went on their way, and there it was, the star they had seen in the east. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed beyond measure. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. You know, in this passage here, uh, we're getting, we get to witness two very different responses to the revelation of a coming king. Between Herod and the wise men, we have a, kind of a compare and a contrast of two different responses that we can have about the news of King Jesus coming. You know, the Magi, um, they traveled far, and they brought gifts to worship the king. They were prepared. They were ready. And Herod, struck with fear, he begins to plot against this threat to his power, to his ownership, and to his control. 
And so what we know about these wise men is that they came from the east, perhaps Babylon or elsewhere. They were educated men. They were men who sought truth. They had some form of power and some form of wealth. Also, we know that somehow they had a portion of the Old Testament scripture um, because they knew what it promised. Whenever they talked about the star, um, you can look in Numbers 24, verse 17, is what they're quoting in reference to the star being a sign of the Messiah that God's going to send. So somehow they knew, at least to an extent, some of the Old Testament, and they were looking forward to it. They expected a king, and when they saw the sign, it brought them to action. And so they teach us something powerful about authentic and sacrificial worship. First thing they did, um, the Magi, they recognized. They noticed something. They were looking for the sign, and when they saw something out of the ordinary, they pursued it. They encountered something, and it affected them to the point of action. You know, sometimes we spend uh, a week at a camp in the summer, and there is powerful worship, and there's deep conversation, and um, there's movements of God. And, we ex- and you can recognize, the students recognize that God is at work, that something powerful is happening. But what always ends up happening is that there's an option, and there's kind of like a, a, the hump of coming back home that's hard to get over. It kind of kills that momentum. And so sometimes we get excited, or we notice, or we see that God's up to work. Um, he's up to something. He's at work. And it catches our attention for a moment. And then something else distracts us and we look away. But it moved them to the point of action. They recognized something and it moved them to the point of action. They recognized and then they responded. They did not just take note to see what came of it. They did not just get excited and lose interest over time. No, they made a plan which required sacrifice on their part. We know about the gifts, so there's at least that monetary sacrifice. But we know they came from a long way. They had to plan a trip. They had to plan a journey. They had to risk um, being robbed or being murdered. They had to give up time at home with their families or their jobs. It affected their habits. It changed their routines. It wasn't planned. But what they encountered was important enough for them um, to respond to in a powerful way. So they recognized, they responded, and when they finally arrived, when they come through the threshold of the home where Jesus is, they worship. They came ready to worship. I think it's important before they even crossed the threshold of his dwelling place that he was worthy. They brought gifts knowing it was going to be true. They took the time to, uh, to measure, to mark their journey there. And this was convicting for me because I'm thinking about it and how powerful or how different would my worship be if I showed up to church on Sunday morning with a heart that was ready to worship. Not one that wanted to look at the bulletin and see if they were playing my songs or not. Not one that wanted to see if the band was too loud or too quiet or if they missed notes or whatever it is. No, if I showed up with a heart that was ready to worship. Or if I opened up God's word and expected to encounter him. I didn't just go on the feeling. I didn't just see if I was feeling it that day or if I was feeling spiritual. No, because I trust God and I know that. These men, they showed up, and they were ready. They were eager to worship. You know, the religious elite of the time were notified of this by the king, Herod. They were taught it all their growing up years, and it happens in their own backyard, and they don't even notice it. Like a universe-shattering moment that changes the game for them, and they're off in left field elsewhere. It doesn't move them. It doesn't catch their eye. They don't respond to it. It doesn't bother them until 30 years later that this guy has a bigger following than they do. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be the one that's face-to-face with it every day and because it's so routine and so ritualistic that whenever God finally moves, I miss it. The wise men didn't come empty-handed. They didn't come half-hearted and their worship was pleasing to God. Not because they brought a lot. Not because they brought gold and frankincense and myrrh. Guess what? The shepherds' worship was pleasing to God, too. And they did not have the same resources to pull from to gift Jesus. And Jesus, his mom, his dad, they didn't play favorites. No, because people, they encountered something. They encountered God, and they responded in an appropriate way. 
They recognized, they responded, and they worshiped. But here's the thing that's tricky, because we're going to look at how King Herod responded, because he also recognized that something was going on. He had his own plan of action, and guess what? He has something that he worshiped too. You know, um, Herod was the most powerful man in the region. He wasn't officially Roman government, but he was kind of put in place by them to keep any insurrection or any riots from happening in the area. And so he's a glorified middleman, but he's living the dream. He's wealthier than the people around him, and if he does his job well, then the Roman government isn't going to come down on him. And he recognizes this threat to his power. He recognizes the threat to what he has built, to what he has created, and what he's spent his whole life cultivating. And he had a strong reaction. Look at Matthew 2, verses 16 through 18. Once he realizes that the wise men did not hold up their end of the deal and come back and tell him, once he realized that they realized that his desire to worship the king was hollow, it was fraudulent, it wasn't really what he was after, he gets frustrated, he gets angry. Verse 16 says, Then Herod, when he saw that he'd been outwitted by the wise men, flew into a rage. He gave orders to massacre all the male children male children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, in keeping with the time he had learned from the wise men. Then what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, for she refused to be consoled because they were no more. Just to be sure He picks a two-year range in an entire community of Jewish people and says, if they have a male child two years old or younger, we got to kill them. That this king of the Jews that had been born, that this king of the world that had been promised and been born was going to be an issue. Because he realized that he wasn't as kingly as he wanted to be. You know, while the wise men recognized the sign of a coming king, Herod recognized the sign of an imposing power. Herod recognized that his throne was at stake. He recognized that his his superiors, his inferiors, all these things could change. He could lose his high place. His inferiors could rebel against him, which would mean his superiors would take him out of office because he wasn't doing his job. He recognized the fragility of his power, and he was willing to take serious action to protect it at the expense of others. A costly expense to others. A whole community, baby boys, massacred because of the threat that he felt. So Herod recognized. Herod also responded. You know, while the Magi responded with plans of worship and sacrificial giving... Herod responded with the orders to carry out the mass killing of Jewish infants. On one side, we see people who displayed self-sacrificial worship. They gave of what they had. They made the effort to get there to show up. We see self-sacrificial worship on one side. And on the other side, we see... Somebody who was forcing sacrifice for the worship of himself. Whether or not that's how he saw it, that's what it was. This was the altar of his power. And to prove a point or to make sure that no one else thought about anything, he was making a statement. He responded by forcing other people um, and trying to cultivate worship of himself, of his own throne, of his own power. Herod worshipped, while the Magi brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh to worship and honor King Jesus, Herod took the lives of many. The bloodshed was his reward. You know, in each day, um, in each of their worship, we see who their God was. The same rule applies for us today. If you watch me close enough, if you watch somebody close enough, if you look at yourself, 
with a little bit of honesty and transparency, you start to see what that person worships. And that's the battle is because, I mean, you're here, you're in this room, I have a feeling you know who's supposed to be at the throne of your heart. I know who's supposed to be at the throne of my heart. But there's a bunch of little G gods that get in the way and they want to take credit. And so how I spend my money or how I spend my time, where my thought life is, what I support, what I work for, what I serve, reveals to myself and to the people around me um, who our God is, who we're worshiping. We don't know much else about the Magi after this. It says they return a different route to their country. But guess what? When their moment came, they worshiped the right God. They realized that even with their own power, their own knowledge, their own wealth, and their own ability, that they weren't worthy of the worship that Jesus was. Even as a baby. That's a powerful distinction. We see that Herod chose himself as the most important force in the area, and he made decisions based on that, on that alone. Not of the good of the people around him, not of his family, but just himself, his legacy, what he had built. And what's powerful about this is that from the first moments of his life, we see Jesus challenging and eventually overcoming every false king. Every fraudulent ruler, every person that wants to play God in their own life, um, Jesus, if not now, it's coming, he will abolish that. Because he is the king. And so we see Herod, who responds to it in a powerful way, in a gross way, in a way that makes us uncomfortable. But what I have to realize is that when Jesus came to take out fraudulent kings, that means me. He said, Jeff, you can't be the Lord of your own life. That's my job. That's my job only. And so when I want the ownership, when I want the authority, when I want the power over my own life, I am rebelling against the true king. At best, it's robbing him of his glory. At worst, it's treason, punishable by death. Because I have rebelled against the true king. And so my question for us today is this. Is whenever we hear the news of Jesus is coming, whenever we hear that news of Jesus is coming, how do we respond? Do we respond as worshipers who are willing to risk their life and their comfort to bring our best to him and yield to his authority? Do we respond as worshipers who will die to their preferences? A lot of y'all probably don't even know this. I have some really cool pictures from last year's Disciple Now weekend. And we, and we gathered in the youth room and filled it up. And it was a whole lot of fun. There's lights and there's music. And it's where um, it, it's the youth space. We're comfortable there. We've made it our own. We've made improvements to it. And the Saturday night of Disciple Now weekend we realize that we've built a little too much comfort into the weekend. And so if you can, like, pump up people enough and try to, like, coerce that emotion, um, maybe some of them are authentically worshiping, maybe some of them aren't. But either way, it feels good. It feels like it's happening. And so we made plans that after Andy taught and they had time with their small group that they were going to come and respond and worship, and we moved it in here. Y'all remember we moved it in here? And it was, like, pitch black and kind of creepy. The light was on. Um, Dallas pushed the piano over here. The guy he brought with him, Jake, was just playing guitar. And there was about 30 of us in a room that's supposed to hold 600 or something like that. It didn't feel full. It didn't feel like camp. But what was powerful about it was that there was nothing else forcing that moment. There was nothing else trying to lead us into it. It was an authentic response to what God had been doing that weekend. It wasn't flashy wasn't comfortable. It's all your peers up here. And a couple of my favorite pictures from that weekend are people, um, our students praying with their leaders here. And it went on, I mean, I think we planned three or four songs, and I think there's people in here for close to an hour and a half. Just finishing what they, just dealing with what they needed to deal with. And so when I hear of King Jesus is coming in my life, do I say, okay, let's do this. You got 45 minutes today, big guy. Speak to me. No, I have to die to my preferences and even my expectations and the area of my life that I've created for him to rule in. Because he's king over all. 
So do I respond as someone um, who wants to worship? Verse 11 is so cool to me because it says, um, well, verse 10, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed beyond measure. If you really stop and think about it, that's pretty strong verbiage. Overjoyed beyond measurable. Uncontainable. They couldn't um, tell you how happy they were. No, overjoyed. And I just imagine it building and building as they approach the house. And when they finally open the door and they come through the threshold and they see Mary holding baby Jesus, it says they fell to their knees. Something tells me that these wise men weren't guys that spent a lot of time on their knees. They were powerful, they were wealthy, they called the shots, but they were overjoyed, and that was just the natural overflow of their worship. That's not the snap of a stiff-necked people, but the response of a heart that is joyful to be in the presence of their king. That's the response of a person who feels unworthy to be there, overwhelmed. I got to spend a lot of time with uh, my nieces and my nephew this week back home for Christmas, and a couple of them are still like 18 months old, just like good baby holding size. I love to hold babies. I bet these guys might have too, but that wasn't their first response. Oh my gosh, can I hold him? No. No, they fell to their knees in worship. That's a powerful moment. So when we encounter Jesus, when we hear of his coming, is that how we respond? Or do we respond as rival kings who see him as a threat to be eliminated and kept out of view? Because I know that for him to reign, it means that I have to yield it means I have to die to myself, I have to acknowledge his power, and I have to obey. It's not a co-manager situation in my heart. Not when it's healthy. It's that Jesus is Lord of it. And I love that the Gospel of Matthew includes this portion because it teaches us something so valuable about the way that Jesus deals with us as foreigners. The way he deals with us as strangers, as people who grew up on the wrong side of the tracks, Look, while these men were powerful and educated, they didn't fit the mold of the religious elite in the area at the time. They came from a different culture. They knew some of the same stuff, but they didn't grow up like these Jewish guys grew up. Like the scribes and Pharisees, there was a difference there. Their bloodline wasn't the right one, yet they were welcomed. They didn't grow up in the same neighborhood, but they still had a seat at the table. Because that's what Jesus does for us. For all people. And it's crucial that we realize that the gospel is not about my heritage or my education or even my life up to this point or how involved I was at church this past year or what I've done or what I haven't done. The gospel doesn't revolve around that angle. What matters is this. How will I respond when I encounter Jesus? There's a first time for that and that first response. And then what we realize is that there's a lifetime of obedience after the fact. Because Jesus keeps initiating things. And we press into it and we let him work. Or we withdraw because it's uncomfortable. Not about my attendance. Not about who my daddy was. Not about any of that. It's about how I respond to the Holy Spirit, to the news of this king who is coming. Do I respond in obedience, or do I try to deflect? When you hear this news of a king who rules over all, how do you respond? Are we going to fall to our knees in worship? Because it's the natural response of a people who realize what they're encountering. Or will we plot for self-preservation? Will we figure out how to get just enough church to feel good? But we don't have to give up all this other stuff on this end. Or I can keep my habits. I can keep spending my money how I want. I can keep watching the movies I watch. I can keep hanging out with who I hang out with. You know, to worship powerfully, we can't let preference or the expectations of others dictate our actions. Because if I'm worshiping preference... Maybe we've all painted a picture of Jesus being the one that we're worshiping, but if it's my preferences, then it's me up there. It's not him. So when my preferences are out of the way, when I can yield, when I can acknowledge his authority, when I let him lead, when it's not always about getting my way, 
That's when we can worship powerfully. Because to worship in a powerful way like the wise men did, we have to recognize that he's worthy to be worshipped, not me. As I die to myself, maybe I'm worried about losing pieces or not having things together. The good news is, is that Jesus always fills in those gaps. Whatever we feel like is coming up short, no, he'll be there. There hasn't been a time that I have surrendered or yielded something or I was impatient and I just let him lead that I was disappointed about it when it came to fruition. Kind of like small group on Sunday nights. Sometimes you're tired and you don't want to go. There hasn't been a time where I've gone to small group and I was like, yeah, <laughs> waste of time. No, no, it's a character thing. It's a discipline thing. And more than that, Jesus fills in those gaps. He's a, he fills us to an overflowing point like the wise men where we're not having to say the right prayer or listen to the right pump-up song on the way to church, but because that we um, are overjoyed to worship and spend time with our church family, to spend time with our Savior, that worship is a natural response to that when he is the king and in his rightful spot. And when there's something that I'm sour about or that I'm not ready to give up quite yet, that's when it's hard for me to worship is because um, I'm playing the role of Herod and I'm trying to figure out what I need to do to not lose power, to not lose control, to save some face, to keep things how I had them. But Jesus shakes them up. He flips it. He takes them away. He brings us more than we can even imagine. And as the band comes back up, we have the opportunity all the time, but we're in this moment now. We have the opportunity now in this moment, and more than the opportunity, we have the need to restore order in the kingdom of our hearts. In the kingdom of my heart, in Jeff's life, in your life, is there a fraudulent king on the throne? Are you trying to split time? Are you trying to kill manage? Because that's not how we find satisfaction in our walks of Christ. That's not how we mature. That's not how we grow. You know, the coming of Jesus is so much more than a sweet story to remember in December. Because it contains life-changing power to anyone who believes. Amen. That's what Romans 1.16 tells us. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's God's power for salvation to anyone who believes. First for the Jew and then for the Gentile. We can follow that. Your nativity might be a good reminder of it, or it might be a habit or a ritual that we've had for the last however many years of our life. But no, in the flesh is God's power for salvation. You know, we saw that the wise men recognized, they responded, and they worshipped. We saw that Herod recognized something, he responded, and he worshipped a false idol. But here's the powerful thing. Our King Jesus, he recognized he recognized our need. He saw my separation. And he was well aware of my state. He recognized it. And he didn't look away. He didn't dismiss it because it was an uncomfortable thought. No, it moved him to action. He did something about it. He recognized and then he responded by moving in, by inhabiting our wounds. John 1, 14 tells us that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's some pretty hands-on problem solving. No, Jesus took up flesh and dwelt among us. Ultimately, he would willingly go to the cross to die in our place, a substitute, like a substitutionary death on the cross that we deserved and be re resurrected so that we might actually be able to worship. Because before then, without God's power, I was stuck worshiping the things of the world. I was stuck worshiping myself or my ideas or my power. But Jesus' death on the cross changed that. That's what the whole veil in the temple being torn signified, was all of a sudden, if you're in Christ, you have access to worship in spirit and in truth. He recognized our need. He responded by coming to earth, dwelling among us, 
living a life that was worthy of the sacrifice to die in our place, to be resurrected so that we might worship in spirit and in truth. And as we wrap up, my question for you is this. Which king deserves our gifts? Which king deserves our best? Which king deserves my heart, my hands? Only King Jesus does. That's what the Magi showed us. And so, as the band plays, today we have the opportunity to respond. How would you respond to his movement in your life today? Maybe it's the first time. How would you respond? Maybe it's happened time and time again. Either way, when Jesus moves and we encounter King Jesus, when he initiates something, there's a response needed on our end. So how would we respond today? You know, the wise men, they were late to the show, but it didn't matter. It didn't matter because they responded appropriately. And honestly, it doesn't say it, but I'm, I'm compelled to believe that they were worshiping before they even got there. They were ready. They were excited. They weren't um, measuring. They weren't comparing. They weren't debating at the last second if he was worthy. They showed up ready to worship. They showed up ready to worship when they encountered the king. So how will we respond? Because today we have the opportunity to start 2020 on the right foot with our King Jesus. Whatever mess, whatever disorganization is going on in my heart, whatever fraudulent king there is, can be dethroned. Jesus can take his rightful spot. I can have some order. I can have some balance. I can have some holiness in my life because of Jesus. And so if that's by starting your relationship with Jesus today, then respond. We won't force you into anything. There's people up here that will pray with you, that will counsel you. Maybe you have Jesus in your life and you've yet to move forward uh, in joining a church or being baptized. Those are next steps of obedience. He's not mad at you for not doing it. But if you want to experience deeper, fuller worship and a walk with God, you've got to be obedient. We want to help you take the next steps of obedience. And that's what our opportunity is today as we respond. Would you guys stand with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, you're so good to us, God. God, we see your power. We see your might. Lord, we see the, the, the need, <laughs> the desperation that we have as fallen people. And God, I pray that I would be reminded of that often so that whenever I want to put um, my power at the throne or whenever I want to lead things or have control, that Jesus, you would remind me that um, I'm not capable to do it well. I don't deserve it. But Jesus, you do. And you take us deeper. Father, you take us um, into repentance. God, into joy. And I pray that today that we would respond, Jesus, and that you would work in a mighty way. Lord, that we wouldn't put it off, that we wouldn't delay it. But um, whatever you have in our hearts today, God, that we would respond to. We ask all this in your name, Jesus.